Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever found it difficult to find an effective plan in your chess games? I've noticed that for chess players rate between 1600 to 2300, the one of the biggest weaknesses is that they don't know what to do in a particular type of chess position. Now, as I set up my little fishy stockfish, let's get on with the game. Starting with a game played by Fabiano Caruana entitled Tuesday 2022 against 2658 rate Indian GM. Sunaldef Leitner Narayanan. And after d6, Karawanda decides to play the move bishop to b5 Moscow variation. But you're going to see that even though it starts out as a Sicilian, that the position actually leads into a Roy Lopez kind of structure. I'm just going to check to make sure. Yep, we've got some audience here. Those of you who are watching this live on Facebook, make sure to use hashtag live. If you're watching the replay, type hashtag replay. And if you're watching on YouTube, type hashtag YouTube. Seriously though, let's get into the game. We had knight f6, rook e1. Uh, and now a weird move by black in the move b6. Um, I think a more useful move is probably to go e6 and, and b5 and you know try to play this kind of setup. But okay, this point is fear is not to show opening fury, but it's probably the way black should play to avoid the hell that happens in the actual game. When Black plays the two passive move, B6. Um, Abe says he's live. Welcome aboard, man. Um, so White goes C3. And you'll notice that in so many of these positions here, uh, where White's playing the bishop B5, a very common plan is to play like a delayed Alapin with C3 and D4. And the reason that's a really great idea is because, well, basically, we have the two pawns side by side in the center, right? And yeah, as I've noted, I got a haircut, indeed. I was waiting a long time, but it seemed like a good moment to do it, yeah? Uh, anyway, after d4, bishop e7. Uh, well, I might ask you guys, because this is a position that is obviously not super theoretical in a sense. But still, white should try to find some good plan. So what would you play in this position? Man, that water is so refreshing. You guys have no idea. I was out on this long walk on the way to get my hair cut and back fine enough. And man, it was like 40 degrees. Anyway, this position, uh, well, let me just show you the move that Caruana played. In the meantime, you can share in the comments what move you would play in this position. I know there's a little bit of a lag between when I speak and when you hear it. If you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, of course, it's no problem. I'd like to take care of you guys as well. Uh, so the game went D5 in this position. And what is it that makes d5 such a great move at this point? Well, first of all, you are murdering this bishop, which is now biting on granite. And also, you'll notice this is now very similar to another opening uh, structure. Do you guys know what it is? Yeah, exactly. It is the Roy Lopez pawn structure, where in that case, you might have, let's say, the pawn on b5, 9, a5 in a trigger in. But in general, a very similar concept, right? Where you've got these pawns and the close center. And when the center is closed, that means you're going to be looking in terms of the breaks on the flanks, where black might be trying to go for f5 or play on the queen side. White is likely going to try to do some similar things himself. And really, this is the fulcrum of being able to play close positions well, is to think in terms of how can we open the position in our favor. And you guys know the answer now, right? It's about preparing a favorable pawn break to open the position in our favor. Uh, James Watson said it's like the Brayer. Yeah, that is actually true. It is very much like a Brayer structure, you know, with a bishop on b7 and the knight on d7. But, you know, okay, it is very similar, to be fair. Probably more so in Chigurin, so well done. Um, begin the game, Caruana played the move c4. And now this might remind you a little bit of the King's Indian kind of structure. But where Black's bishops, instead of being on like g7 and on c8 and going like g6, f5, boom, boom, boom. Instead, black is a very long way from getting f5 in any kind of reasonable version. But as Evgeny Agrest has said many times in the past, no pawn break equals no plan in the closed positions. And that's kind of true for black here as well. I mean, you could go b5, but after knight d7 or b3, it's kind of like, where are you going from here? Like, if you take, I just take back. If you attack me, I just defend. And I mean, black has zero counterplay in this kind of structure. Which is why in the game, black kind of just got murdered pretty badly. Uh, let's enjoy it. Uh, so, okay, the game went uh, for with g6. So, black is indeed going for this plan with f5. Uh, black now goes knight h5. And 
If I was Caruana, I'd probably flick in Bishop H6 just to kind of be a little bit annoying. Um, the only time maybe you wouldn't go Bishop H6 is, let's say, if they could go Bishop G5 and trade your good Bishop for their bad Bishop. But obviously the Knight is covering it, yeah? So it's not a problem. Uh, but Carolina's Rook B1 is also a perfectly good move at this point. And okay, the idea of Rook B1 is essentially to prepare the move B4, which Carolina actually plays immediately. Um, it's not maybe the worst move on the board, but okay, it's also true to a Blitz game. Inevitably going to be some mistakes, but that's also an opportunity for you guys to learn, right? To see that Grandmasters even make mistakes with not much time on the clock. And the reason I'm not a big fan of B4 at this exact moment, uh, compared to playing Bishop H6 and keeping the options open, is that after take take, you are giving the C5 outpost to the knight, which I would maybe prefer to avoid if it's possible. But I guess Caruana realized that if you play, let's say, knight c5 now, well, you can just go knight a4 and just trade off the knight and still, you know, have the pressure on b6. So it actually turns out that, you know, it's not really a problem in reality. You know, if they take, take, you've got bishop e3 and you're just going to go boom, boom, pow against that b6 pawn and, you know, Bob is your uncle after this. So Narayanan realized that it's better to keep the knight on d7 actually at this point which in a way somewhat vindicates Caruana's B4 move. Uh, I'd probably go remove like Rook C8 if I was black, or maybe the computer's idea is to go A5 and to try to free the bad bishop uh, with Bishop A6. But you are also giving white knight B5, and that's a nice square for the knight. So even here, white is still, let's say, significantly better. By the way, I'm checking the comments, guys, so you know I do look every now and then. It's not like this is just a lecture, but want to have it a little bit interactive so you guys can have more fun and really absorb the lessons, right? Uh, so anyway, continuing on, the actual game went queen c7, we had bishop e3. I'm going to fast forward fairly fast past this point, because I do have another game I want to share with you. It's all right if we over deliver. So we have the move f5. So black is trying to get counterplay on the king side. Um, if I were to play e takes f5, it's kind of an interesting question, you know, what way would you take back on f5 in this position? Taking with the pawn might look more natural, and maybe it's not so terrible. But in the Royal Lopez, you can often play moves like bishop h6, knight g5, and actually start attacking the black king. That's one big difference compared to King's Indian, where somehow it's a lot harder to attack their king when they go f5 in this sort of structure. But here it kind of works well. That said, black could also go knight f5, and white is still better, of course, but, you know, black's getting a little bit of peace play, let's say. Um... Well, in the game, White decides not to play EF5. Of course, it would be quite a critical decision, right? If you are changing the pawn structure suddenly, like with a pawn exchange or a piece exchange, that's an important strategic decision. Uh, but White goes Rook EB1. I think this move by Caruana is even better. Because let's say you defend that weak pawn. I noticed, by the way, how easy Caruana's plan is, because he found his weakness, and he just went focused by like, pew, 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 take down that uh, B6 pawn. Black should probably go bishop c8, but it's a depressing move to undevelop the piece back, right? You know, even knight a4 and just, you know, pile on this, and, and black isn't a whole lot of bother here. So black tried to get out of the straight jacket and tried to break free with the move b5, saying that if you take the pawn, then you lose the knight, so it's a poison pawn. But it turns out b5 is actually a mistake, but I know a lot of you who are watching this, you would think, oh, b5, black is getting free, they're getting all this counterplay, what do I do? What do I do? If you just stay calm for one second, you'll realize that white is actually winning in this position. The answer is... Dramatic pause, so you have time to actually write in the comments what move you would play here as white on move uh, 19. It's amazing, right? Carolina's being a 2650 GM by move 19. Just magic. But that's what happens when you've got a good plan. So, the answer is that... Caruana played the move a4 in this position. Uh, to be fair, other moves are also winning. It's not like black is really threatening to take, you know, when you have rook c4, or actually probably even better, you can just go, like, bishop a7 and, you know, just win material, right? So black isn't actually threatening to take, but a lot of people, they would panic about bc4, and they would make a mistake as a result, when actually just keeping up the tension is fine. And Abe said, what's the play, James? <laughs> it's like, yeah, new alter ego, because I have the moustache and a beard, new haircut, you know, Max got abducted and the, you know, the double is in. Uh, but seriously though, yeah, after a4, black goes f4 because he doesn't know what else to do. 
And why it's not a computer, so he doesn't see that bishop a7 is winning. But he doesn't need to, because bishop d2 is also winning. If black were to take this pawn on a4, we would just take back... Frankly, either bishop or knight is probably fine, but let's say knight. And you would just be ready to, you know, prepare a c5 push. Kill d6, get a pass pawn. a6 is a bit of a ripe fruit for plucking. So white should win this. Maybe even some creative idea could be like to go queen e1, bishop to c a5, or maybe even smarter, just maneuver the knight to d3, and again, prepare c5. When you got the pawn break, you've got the plan, guys. So next up, we have the move bc4. This is what happened in the game. Kawanda decided to trade the queens, which engine is not a, it's not a favorite move, but it's still good enough. You know, the rook is preparing to penetrate. Black tries to move rook fc8, but he just missed something kind of important here. Do you guys see the trick that white can play to just win the game pretty much on the spot? So at the moment, black's pieces are a little bit overloaded, and here's how we take advantage of it. This is how you beat the 2650 GM in Blitz and make him look like they just started playing chess yesterday. You play the move rook takes b7. Um, okay, there are other moves like rook, C B rook cb4 that are also winning, but this is the kill shot. Rook b7 hangs the rook to rook take c8. So this is why we see that the rook on b8 is a little overloaded. And after rook c4 and rook d7, it turns out that white is simply won a bishop and a knight for a rook, yeah? And black is not really in time to go rook b2, in fact. Uh, because you just go bishop d3 and go boom, boom, pow. Uh, but in the game, we instead had the move bishop d8. Um, I'll show you final moves very quickly. Uh, it was bishop d3... Rook c5 captures, like he's trying to get counterplay, but rook c6 shuts that down. You have no idea how much I want to swear, but there might be kids watching this, so I'll hold my tongue. Uh, we have rook takes c6, dc6, king f8, knight d5, like why take a free pawn when you can just put the squeeze on, like take c7 into mezzo, rook e8, bishop a6, and the pawn is coming to the promised land. And since White is going to be a piece up for nothing after collecting the Rook, this is why Narayanan resigned. And Caruana collected the win in the final round. And of course, all of the lovely confetti that you get on chess.com when you finally finish the tournament. Uh, but seriously though, I have one more game to share with you guys. I know that you can handle it. Also write in the comments below, what did you love most of all about this game? What was an insight that you grabbed onto that you're going to use to beat your arch nemesis at your next chess tournament or in your next online chess game? Let me know, and while you're doing that, let's do a little transition to the next game, which is a game with a black win, because, well, it's all well and good to know how to win with white and flog a dead horse, but how do you win with the black pieces? There are two keys to winning with the black pieces that are not so, let's say, quite the same when playing with white. The first one is you need to be a little bit patient and let the opponent make some mistakes, and two, you've got to realize that, well, it's sort of related, but, you know, instead of going for the guy's throat for move right one, you know, playing Stafford Gambit or England or some crap like this, that instead, you know, you actually play a serious opening and let them kind of come to you a little bit, and then boom, counter-strike. So this game was played between Bogdan Daniel Diak, uh, nearly 2700 rated young GM from Romania, top player in Romania, playing as Jordan Van Forest, one of the top players in the Netherlands. I think number two player in the Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken, behind Giri. Uh, anyway... Here, Diak plays a line I actually covered in a file on my Facebook profile not that long ago. 10 viewers! That's what I'm talking about. 10 viewers, you showed up. You're here to improve your chess. Let's see how to beat the system that I recommended for white to you guys before. D3. And you might think, what is this D3 rubbish? Like, are you trying to, you know, go in a little cocoon and try to avoid all the attacks? But D3 is a move that, you know, we should show a little respect because... Yeah, take, take, you lose the right to castle as white, but the king is not that stupid on d1. I mean, it can go to c2 later, and white does have a nice space advantage, so we have to come up with a good plan here. And that's exactly what Van Foris does. You're going to love this game. We have knight f6. If white goes knight bd2, just g6, and if you're able to, you know, pin and win with the bishops, you can trade off some pieces and maintain the balance that way. Because in principle, you want to trade off the minor piece when you have less space. Yes, so yes, that's the way to ease the cramp, as it were. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, you're hosting a party and your house is full. Kick half the people out and suddenly, you know, you're having fun again. 
anyway, the game continued with Knight FD2 trying to go F3 and, you know, put the distance four against the, the Knight, as it were. Uh, so Black plays the move G6. Actually, I'd recommend some different moves, like playing an Alpha Zero style, playing like H5, G5, this kind of crazy stuff, and White then doing the same because, well, if one opponent's playing a computer, then probably you should as well. Uh, but jokes aside, the move G6 in the game, it's not a terrible move either. It wouldn't be my top choice, but I wouldn't call it an outright mistake just yet. Uh, though if you are going to play this, I think bishop h6 and trying to trade the bishops is probably sensible. To bishop g7, I think that, you know, the bishop might look nice on this square. But once white plays a move like c3 as such, what you're going to notice is the bishop is very badly placed on g7. So it turns out that actually black didn't manage to find the right plan of exchanging the pieces. And this is why he is actually quite a bit worse in this position. So the good news is that... Grandmasters also make mistakes. You don't need to be a genius and play like Stockfish every move to win a game of chess. But it also means that planning is not just good when you're better. It's also useful when you're worse in order to figure out how to minimize the disadvantage and how to try to get back in the fight, as it were. So what uh, Black played? Vishnu said, nice haircut. Yeah, thank you. Do it for you guys. Um, and also mainly do it for my family because you have no idea how long my, uh, you know, my wife and my mum were saying, like, to get rid of the you know, of the hair. I mean, I was kind of digging the Jewish look personally, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to mix up every now and again. Anyway, after C3, well, let me ask you guys this. Of Black's developed pieces, uh, I'm just going to highlight them just so you know, which one would you say is probably the, has the least potential in this kind of pawn structure? So it's an interesting question, because frankly, all the pieces kind of suck at the moment. But we can see that this knight is really not doing much because the pawns are just completely dominating it with their placement, right? So what uh, Van Foris did is he played this move of knight to e8. Uh, if you want to put the rook on the open file, I mean, it's not a bad move by any means, but it's just that it's kind of a little bit short term. And it, yeah, you solve the rook's problem and get on open file, but like where are the other pieces kind of going in a sense? Because if white doesn't put a rook on the file himself, like your rook doesn't really have an entry point, if that makes sense. So rook d8 is playable, but I kind of like the move knight e8 that was played in the game because it allows you to put the knight on d6, and now you have something that you didn't have a couple of moves ago. What you didn't have a couple of moves ago was a good pawn break to try to open up the position and use the fact that you are a little ahead in development currently, uh, and that is to play f5 and try to rip it open that way. Now, I will say, to be fair, if white plays correctly, white does still have quite a significant advantage at this point. But in the game, white doesn't find the best way. Apparently, the move white should, can go for is a move like knight b3, which looks kind of weird, but computer is saying you have a very nice tempo move, which without this move, black would just be totally fine, like e f5, bishop f5, and, you know, peace play. But bishop g5 is a really nice idea where, you know, you play a strong counterattack. And that gives you the time after black defends the e-pawn to go knight d2 and kind of consolidate this e4 structure. It's not like black is lost or anything, but it's kind of unpleasant. You know, you don't really have a great square for your uh, your bishop on c8 and, you know, some other pieces like the bishop and knight here. They're a little bit stuck here, but it's got a bit more space and so on. Uh, white goes knight c4 instead, which actually is not such a bad move either. Uh, interesting question, because it's been a while since I've set you guys a puzzle. What would you play here if black played the move bishop e6, just out of interest? How would you deal with the tension between the knights? Because this kind of tension question, if you're playing a player of a similar rating, let's say, you know, you're both 2000 plus, these are the decisions going to determine whether you outplay your opponent or whether they outplay you, okay? So why would you deal with the tension between the knights? I want to see you guys say it in the comments, because active learning, that's where the magic happens. And while you do that, I'm going to have another sip of water because like 40 degrees. I don't need to pay for the sauna. I already have the sauna in my room. But seriously, though, the answer to this position here is that you can just keep the tension with knight ba3. Because it's a way you kind of like both your knights want to go to c4, right? So if they take on c4, you can actually go and bishop take c4 your bishop gets more active with the recapture. You basically develop the piece for free. 
And if they swap again, then your knight then comes to a better square of their recapture, right? So in two exchanges, you improved your position twice with the exchanges. And what really matters when evaluating these exchanges, by the way, is not what pieces are traded from the board, but what is left on the board. And if we look at that right here, guys, I mean, the bishop is very stupid compared to this guy. Our knight is a lot better than their knight. We can play moves like a5 and fix b7 as a weakness. Our rook is going to kind of get to the open file. Um, okay, they can play rook d8, but it's kind of like, what are you doing from here? You know, I go bishop b3 and how are you going to deal with the pressure on the a7 pawn, you know, unless your rook is there babysitting, but, you know, the rook is too qualified for this. Mananaja, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. I have drunk some coffee and I'm speaking a bit quickly. But yeah, well done, knight ba3. You got the move right. See, guys, it's easy when you learn chess the right way. When you see how the masters sync, it's actually not that hard for you to do it yourself when we guide you a little through the process, yeah? So, good job. And, uh, yeah, white is actually technically winning in this position. You know, if they go e5, I mean, you just move the bishop. d6 and beckons is a beautiful outpost for the knight. And this is actually a very advanced topic. Like, if you are 2,000 plus and you want to go beyond just looking for the good pawn breaks, but actually, you know looking for the ways to make the opponent weak in their position. This is the ninja trick. You provoke him with e5, like, oh, I gained a tempo on the bishop. We are rocking and rolling. But then bishop e3, and then they left some wounds uh, behind as such. It's kind of like, you know, they throw a punch at the wall, but then their hand is bruised. That's kind of what have to happen to black here. And white is basically just winning as you'll figure out for yourself if you, you know, play out the position a little. But anyway... Instead of this, we've kind of focused so far on what white is aiming for in these positions. But in the game, black goes f5, actually. Um, my apologies, should be f5. Then after e5, like, this position should just be just totally dominant for white, because this bishop is now in a prison. But somehow, Van Furies finds a way out. I mean, this should, by all intents, have just be completely lost. But somehow, white manages to screw it up. We're after knight f3. Well, now bishop d5. Now the bishop, at least, is kind of free. Bishop e3, and this is where we see why White lost this game. He lost the game because he didn't show enough respect to his opponent's ideas. I mean, we all know little kids, you know, who are playing chess and all they're focused on is, oh, let's put my knight and queen here so I can checkmate the king. Let's, you know, try and attack his horsey. Let's try and get my king to safety. Let's push it past pawn. It's the thinking of like, me, 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 me. And they're not thinking about what is the opponent trying to do. You see, if you're not aware of your opponent's threats, then how are you possibly going to stop them? So, instead of the move bishop e3, let's think about this more prophylactically. In other words, think about what the opponent is trying to do as well. What would be the move that you would play as white to keep black bottled up, to keep the genie in the bottle and not let the magic out for black's position? Come on, guys, don't leave me standing here. Make a move. Okay, I'm joking with you a little bit, but yeah, well done if you came up with... Well, there's actually a few good moves, but the one that I think is the most practical and probably just the best, quite frankly, is a move h4. We just completely stop them playing g5 and trying to chip away at the uh, e5 pawn, because, I mean, if you look at all of the, the placement of black's minor pieces, you know, they're all focus firing on the e5 pawn, right? You know, here... I'll go back here to demonstrate, like here, here, here. Like even the bishop on d5 is playing a role because it's attacking one of the defenders of the, the e5 pawn. Yes, so yes. Uh, so I see a few of you made some comments. Tim said b4, a5. I mean, positionally, these are good moves to grab space on the queen side, but you want to wait to do it until you've stopped the opponent's counterplay and when you've got some more of your pieces developed as such. It's what we like to say a good idea, just not the right time for it just yet. And uh, Abe was saying knight d2. Um, I'm not sure which knight you meant, but if you're saying knight fd2, that's actually probably the second best move in the position. Um, but it does require you to realize that if black goes g5, that, you know, you can't play g3 because you are hanging the rook. And, you know, this would be a mistake except for the fact that the computer kind of, you know, throws you a lifeline here, Abe. And then, uh, well, you can play uh, knight e3, as it turns out. Uh, because, well... The idea is that either if G takes F4, uh, you play like knight D5 and you win a piece. 
Like, there's just disgusting engine lines at this point. Um, so that's kind of a funny point. Knight FD2 does actually work. But you sort of yeah, have to kind of see this engine move in knight e3 with the idea of killing the bishop, let's say, if e6, for example, like to take. And yeah, it turns out that black's remaining piece are kind of dumb in this sort of structure, quite frankly. Um, and you're able to build your beautiful pawn chain. So uh, I don't know if you got lucky or if it was like all part of the plan, but either way, nice work. 14 viewers. We have a party, folks. Keep up the energy, guys. You rock. Seb says hello. Welcome aboard, man. Great to have you here for this session on finding a plan. And I was just saying that, yeah, h4 is the move to stop g5. Now, a natural question is, what if black just goes h6 and says, screw you, I'm playing g5 anyway? Well, then we could actually maybe use Ape's idea of playing like knight fd2 and knight e3. Or it turns out you can even play knight e3 immediately, in fact. And the big difference here is that, well, with the pawn being on h6, it actually makes a really big difference. Uh, let me show it to you. This is a good example of the comparison method, by the way. The toughest calculation technique in the world, but if you master it, you can beat anybody. Mark my words. This is how the computers smash us in over the board games. Well, they don't play over the board because we don't let them in, but anyway, the point is, if black were to take f3 and then play to move g5, okay, it is true you are losing a piece, but what I want to show you guys is that after take, take, that let's say after knight f5, that if you didn't have like these pawns traded as such, like the pawns were back here on the H file. You could maybe get away with playing GF4 and live to tell the tale. But because the pawns are traded like 97 is checkmate. Uh, okay, not a perfect example of comparison method because white had 50 billion wins before that as well as this move. But it shows how one little difference in the pawn structure can really change the whole evaluation in another situation, right? So anyway, I've talked a while about this game. Let's now see how white managed to blow it and lose. He start off by playing bishop to e3, so not playing the move h4. Ape says, pure luck, you know me. Ha, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, so here, uh, black played the move of g5. No big surprise there. If they play fg5, well, we already see that in a position like this, black already has a slightly better structure because of white having doubled pawns. I mean, it's not fatal. I mean, if white trades a knight, probably position is still only a little better for black. Um, but, you know, you can definitely push for a win with the unbalanced structure and the, you know, more active bishops. As I like to say in four-player chess, always respect the bishops. In any case, the game went a little differently with e6, trying to put the bishop out of position and then take. But sometimes the key to playing great chess is knowing when to admit that, yeah, my piece just moved there, but now it's time to move it back. And that's something a lot of your opponents are going to miss. They're going to think, hang on, didn't the bishop just come from there? But bishop d5 is a great move. Clearing the way for e5 and boom, boom, pow in the center. Now, if white is smart, he is going to play bishop d3 and attack the pawn and somehow be okay. But because this is three minute chess, the players are not going to be very smart, even if you're a grandmaster. I speak from my own experience here. And so white plays the move rook e1. Natural move rook on the open file. But e5 and now black is the one dominating. Now, white is the one who doesn't have a good pawn break, whose piece are going to get kicked like soccer balls in the center, and black is the one who's got the momentum, who's got that initiative. For those of you watching, if you don't know what the initiative is, it's when you have a flow of threats, consecutive threats, that the opponent is not able to ignore, and it basically we limit their options quite significantly by kicking them around like a football. In any case, let's continue with how the game went. The game went h4, which is not the best move, actually. It's a big mistake, because you can just start, you know, doing Maze Runner style, a4. If the bishop goes back, you just go e4, you just go push him, baby, push, push, push. And look at this. You've got a protected pass pawn that's murdering the bishop on c1. They can't go g3 because the pin is going to go boom, boom, and game is over, man. Uh, but black goes rook f8, saying that, you know what, I'm just going to prepare the idea. Um, which does mean that black is not completely crushing anymore. Uh, at least if white comes up with this computer move of bishop g1. Good luck finding that. Uh, but he goes for the more natural bishop f2. And now... Oh, you could have played e4, Van Foris. That would have been the way. Kick him with tempo. Because he played him with f4 instead. And he gave white an unlikely chance to survive here. Now, this is maybe not so much finding a plan. But this is how to deal with the opponent's plan. This is the next level ninja style. So, what is the way for white to save himself at this point? 
Now, I've got to be careful. Like, ten times I've come so close to swearing on this, uh, on this live video. I've got to watch my language a bit. Let's see what moves you guys have come up with in the chat. Okay. It's the one... Okay, I'll show you what White played in the game, because this is not the answer. He played the move of Knight FD2. And after E4, he got, you know, basically murdered in cold blood by a Van Forest. But of course, there is a better move for Diak. And we know of the saying of the wrong Rook. But this one is kind of an example of the wrong Knights as such. Not every day you find that in your chess book, right? So White should have played Knight CD2 and prepared the counterattack. Because after E4, you were not forced to move your Knight and blunder a piece to the fork. But we hit him back with C4. And believe it or not, white is still in the game at this point. Because if you go takey here, white goes take, take, takey here. And suddenly white is the one who is better in uh, in this position. Uh, if FG2, you're not winning a piece. Or not winning a pawn, I should say. Because after captures bishop G2, your bishop is actually going to be defending the pawn. Uh, which is pretty convenient, to say the least. So black should probably play some other move after C4. Uh, like e3, but okay, you're only getting the piece back. You know, it's not like you're, I don't know, drafting a new constitution or something here as black. But anyway, let's continue with how the game played out so you can see how black actually won, how to play the winning plan. It's you go e4, it's you push the pawn again, e3, and then you just play with great energy because right now these guys are stuck at home wishing that they were had employment, but you know, we don't let the slackers off so easily. We go knight d to e5, which actually is probably not the best move. I think probably should just take the bishop and, you know, just rip open the king or something, c5, whatever. There are a lot of winning moves for black. I mean, improving the worst place piece with rook dead is surely not bad either. But the game went knight d5. We had captures, 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 and not captures, believe it or not, at this moment. But we're not playing checkers here, guys. Bishop d3, and even with black kind of slightly screwing up on move 24. He's still got the bishop pair. He's still got a monster pass pawn. And he still managed to win. H5. Rook E7. Nice little move to cover the this rank. Rook H4. Threatening to go captures and captures. But black scurries out of the way. Bishop C7. G6. H6 keeping the control. We don't want to open the H file and you know give them a free attack on the king. You know, sometimes this happens in chess that your opponents actually kind of help you out and they say, yeah, man, I'm just going to, you know, give you everything that you could possibly want on a silver platter and I'll even put the cherry on top. But of course, this is not what ideal chess is. Instead, we lock it down with h6. Why well, played knight eight d4. Uh, offering a pawn to try to get some knight f5 counterplay. Uh, Van Foris comes up with a nice way to deal with it. He just plays rook f8 here. So that if white does play knight f5, we go for the big exchange sack. Captures, 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 and boom, boom, thanks for the game. The connected pass pawn 6 beat everything up to a royal flush, as said by my past chess coach, Ian Rogers. The game instead continued with rook g4, rook e5, hit him this way, attack the weaknesses, rook h1, c5, boot that knight out of the way, force it back to a passive square. Or in the case the game, white went g7 in frustration, but after rook f6, it's nothing. You don't have bishop h7 because the bishop is covering the promotion square from uh, d5, as it were. Knight f3, rook e7, and now we collect the harvest. We reap what we've sown, putting in those many hours of hard chess work, learning from grandmasters like me. In any case, the game concluded with rook d1, uh, not king d1, rook d1, rook takes g7. Which actually is probably not best, because bishop h7, they can try to at least, you know, grovel in a, a pawn down ending. But anyway, white plays bishop g6 instead, because he's pissed off with himself. And after bishop e4, we pin and win. Bishop e4, rook g4, this is how the game ended. Captures, captures. Well, rook d7 is not a capture, but we slide the rook back, defend the bishop with the x-ray. And here white realizes his number is up. Because the Rook's getting trade and Black's up a million pieces. And this is why Diak resigned, giving Van Forest the win. Again, in the title Tuesday Blitz. And this is why I love showing you these recent Blitz games. Because they're just like Stony Games of Old Masters. It's where you see the mistakes. You see the tension. You see how to outplay people. How to come with plans so easy that you would come up with in a classical game yourself. This is where the magic happens. It's my 
secret trick I've learned from the times, you know, I had like 12 hours of coaching sessions in one day. I had to find ways to, you know, find shortcuts to get you the results really fast without needing to prepare an hour for each lesson. This is some of the magic here. So to summarize, what are the main things that you learned about finding a plan in this session today? I want to hear it in the comments, guys. Be active learners. Don't be like, you know, just trying to blindly memorize what's the, the lessons. If you're not sure because I was talking 500 words a minute, then let me summarize the three key points that we took away from today. The first point is in closed positions, or even just in position in general, look for the pawn break because the pawn break is what's going to bring your pieces to life. It's what's going to create the weaknesses in the opponent's structure. And that's how you're going to crack down and put the pressure on the opponent until they crack until they make that mistake, and then you punish and take the win. Second key lesson of how to find a plan, look for the dumbest piece in your position and try to make it the star. It's like links in a chain. You're only as strong as your weakest link. I know this as well with me leading a team that I've got to make sure that my employees, like my team of coaches, that they're all on their A game, that I give them the training. The chess version of that is find your worst place piece and put it on a good square, and you'll be amazed at the synergy and the magic that comes together when all of your pieces are working towards a common goal. And the third step is to not be a complete selfish prick. I am joking, of course, but to also think about what the opponent is trying to do as well as such. So that's the thing. If you're stuck and you're like, I don't know what to do, then maybe the key is not in what do I do, but how do I stop my opponent's best idea so that I can then do what I want to do as such. It's kind of like, you know, a simple example would be, man, I want to, you know, get into that $5,000, you know, special program as such so that I can kick everyone's asses in chess, but I don't know how to get there. Well, if you stop thinking in terms of like, well, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to offer this for 5 k Oh, I have someone work me for one year. Boom, you got the money just like that. It's easy. Once you think in terms of solutions, when you have these simple, like, three-step process like I'm showing you, the magic just happens. So if you did enjoy this video, those watching on YouTube, like, subscribe. Also, make sure to reach out to me. You can do it via DM. You can type in the comments. I don't really care. We'll make sure, you know, that you are taken care of and that we get you to that 2,000 plus or to that mass level, whatever your goal may be. Actually, it's something I learned just yesterday that in the US, you guys actually have a US candidate master title at 2,000. So you know what? You can even become a master at 2,000, which I didn't know before. So how cool is that? Anyway, that's about all for now. I do have a call pretty shortly. So anyway, it was fun sharing this with you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.